I have you now. They want to mess with my joy. They're going to pay for it. This is the way. You may file when ready. Blow that piece of junk out of the sky! The way you're fighting, you wouldn't have lasted long. Hello there. You know me! I think this beat does not make you intelligent. Welcome to another episode of the Star Wars Station Communication Podcast. I'm your host, Carter. We had a phenomenal Mandalorian episode to talk about today. I think it is the standout episode of Season 3. We've been building, building, building with all of the last episodes, and we finally started to see the plot lines come together and form one story, we're headed in one direction now, and it is super exciting. Also today, we got some legendary Bad Batch episodes. We got the finale of the Bad Batch, and you can listen to that in our Season 2 wrap-up of the Bad Batch that's going to release on Friday. We're going to talk about the last four episodes and our opinion on the season overall. But today, we have a super-packed show. We've got all of our talk about The Mandalorian. We've also got our takes on another Star Wars show that released this week that many people probably didn't hear about, and so we're going to talk about that. And there was a lot of tabletop gaming news this week out of Adepticon, and we're going to talk about all of that. Right now, though, for the meat of our podcast, we're here to talk about that legendary Mandalorian episode, and here to talk about that Mandalorian episode with me is the Navarro native himself, Colin Archer. Hey, Carter. I'm glad to be back. Uh... This, this episode has me speechless. I don't know what to talk about first, but we will talk about and show to our loyal viewers the rapid reactions. Let's listen to those first. He doesn't seem to take a hint, this guy. Two words, Colin. Garazeb Aurelios. If this episode was 10 minutes long and it ended on that scene, it was the best episode of The Mandalorian I'd ever seen because of that. I, you know, last week we get uh, Keller and Beck, and you know we've tried to predict Rebels characters for how long there now, and we get <laughs> Zeb Aurelios. I know, and I, Who? And I checked. <laughs> it was voiced by Steve Bloom or Blum, however you say his name. Yep. Yep. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> I mean, if you were like, if you know, these are the Rebel characters that we're going to put in the Mandalorian show. Your first guess is not Zeb when there's a Mandalorian in the Rebels crew. But even still, the CGI to make a live-action Lasat, I just, I really, I knew he was going to come, but I thought it'd be, with this cameo here, obviously it's a small cameo, but with this cameo, I am certain he's going to wind up in the Ahsoka show. And the CGI looked great. I mean, it looked really good. Right, right. We've been, I'm, Gone back. I think I watched that scene four times just to absorb it all. I know. And yeah, he's he's CGI, and I, hopefully they wouldn't spend the money on these art assets just to put him in a twenty second hole in an episode, right? Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, so if you've played the Jedi Fallen Order video game, you know Cal Kestis's original master was also a Lasat, and this looks a lot like the video game art asset. But it's way, way boosted because it looks, I mean, obviously it's CGI, but it looks real. I mean, as real as a Star Wars alien can look. He sounds good and his movements were so fluid. We didn't see the bottom half of his body. That's the only thing. He has like goat legs and I really want to know how they're going to make that work. I I watched it several times. Like I said, it it shows him standing there and he's, I'll send you a screenshot later. He's, He's standing there at the end of the bar. He looks good. Okay, good. Um, and the rest of the episode, I mean, it's it's nonstop action. This felt, of all the season three episodes, I'd say this one might be my favorite. And this one felt the most Mandalorian of the whole thing. And it felt epic. It was large. And now we see the plot line from the Coruscant episode starting to weave in. We don't know where Dr. Pershing is, but obviously Katie O'Brien's character, Elia Kane, is there. Um, we've gotten Carson Tava finally, and so we're really going to start to see the weave together. And Bo-Katan, I mean, her being allowed to take her helmet off, which they're not going to waste yeah, Katie she, Sack off she like that. She walks both, what is, how did she put it? She uh, she w- is in both worlds. She is in she both worlds. Both paths, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and so, what do you think about the uh, armor kicking ass? It's the first time we've got to see her do that. She straight dunked on those guys. That oh, she cool. destroyed them. I know. Well, she does a little bit of fighting, I think, in season one, but this was just over the top. It was perfect, and it looked so good. The Mando's coming in to save Navarro. They've got a permanent base of operations, um, and it was it just all tied together really, really well. And Vane didn't escape for no reason. Vane is absolutely. Pr- part of this, you know, imperial conspiracy that um, Carson Tava's character, or not Carson Tava's character, that Carson Tava is really pushing right here. Yeah, we, we know for sure who the big bad is for what, the last two episodes? Three. We got three left. Last, yeah, so we know who the big bad is. Uh, I've got a lot to say about the pirate attack and, and the Mandalorians. Uh, R five giving him away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was funny. I was as soon as he was at the covert, I was like, now how did he figure it out? And I knew they were going to explain it because they would have to. Um, but that was a that was a fine enough explanation. Um, only thing I'm sad about, and I'm not really that sad, but I I really liked the design of Gorian Shard, and so I hate that he's a two episode and done kind of guy. But he went out with a bang. I mean, that was a really exciting episode. We got to see that Corsair in action. It was really fun. I mean, I thought the whole episode was just it didn't it didn't slow down. It was long. It was 41 minutes and it felt it didn't feel quick. It felt like we got a lot in there, but it didn't drag. I just I yeah. really think they got a lot done with this episode. Lots of little threads to weave together. Uh you know, you like you said the Lie Kane, Captain Tava, Pirates, Mandos, Grief Karga, um and probably all kinds of little things that we are going to have to figure out on the second watch and then zeb oh my ah, goodness i know again like i said <laughs> if that was all that we saw in this episode i would I, this would still be the best episode of season three it was just awesome to see zeb on screen i mean it was amazing to see zeb on screen and he's in new republic flight fatigues so we know that something's going on there with him in the new republic but really 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 exciting episode i was so happy to have seen all of that very exciting so let's get right into it right now with the rest of our breakdown. We're going to move from rapid reactions into the meat of this episode right now. Those were our candid rapid reactions. As you can hear, we are so excited about Zeb particularly. There were a lot of really exciting things in this episode, but he absolutely stole the show. I mean, it was it was amazing to finally see our second member of yes. the Ghost crew in live action. Important to remember, we got Chopper in Rogue One, but an astromech right, is and so this easy. is the third character from Rebels. We also have the Pergils. Yes, you're right, exactly. So we are getting more and more Rebels tie-ins. Can, can you see something coming? Yeah, is, exactly. What's on the horizon here, Carter? <laughs> We're getting Ahsoka. <laughs> it's basically the Rebels sequel. So if you haven't checked out Rebels, it is in my it is my favorite non-George Lucas Star Wars property. I think that it is the watermark for non-George Lucas Star Wars. Every discussion I get into with people on the street, and I'm like, oh man, this was in Mando, that was in Mando, you gotta check this out. Oh, and they respond, I never watch Rebels. I'm like, man, and it's always like, it was too slow, it's a kid's show. I'm like, you need to adjust your attitude, sir. Exactly. Because it is, I had the same attitude before I was going into it. It's a kid's show. Wrong. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, season one, the first half was a little rocky. But even by the end, you get a lot of really good plot. And seasons two through four are just legendary. I mean, it it is phenomenal. So we got Zeb in this episode. To learn more about him, go check out Rebels. But we got a lot in this episode beyond Zeb. And so I think it's time we just hop right in. The episode directed by Peter Ramsey. Um, This was his Star Wars debut, and he knocked it out of the park. I mean, he absolutely smashed it for the first Star Wars thing he's ever made. Um, All he'd made, not all he'd made prior to this, but the most notable thing he'd made prior to this was Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which was also really popular. fantastic movie. Yeah, exactly. And they got a second one coming. Um, I believe he's the director on that. This episode written by Jon Favreau. No surprise there. He wrote all of the episodes. This is his show. He's the show runner. Um, And so, again, good, good writing from Jon Favreau. But... The episode starts out with us on Navarro with Grief Karga just doing some city administration work, basically. I mean, he's doing the nitty-gritty of being a high magistrate. Yeah, he's got all the droids. He's got engineers. 
He's got big plans. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've seen Navarro prosper so much. Just this dialogue indicates to us how much it's prospering. And then he hears screaming outside, and above above the city is this giant pirate vessel. Corsair. It is so intimidating. It is it is the same vessel that we saw in the first episode of this season, and it's just an. I mean, it's a cool shot to get to see this flying over the city, and then we see the bubble turrets pop out, and Gorian Shard pops up on a hologram that he's hailed in Grief Karga's office. Yeah, this is a really good conversation that we pick up a lot of notes. You know, um, <clears throat> Grief Karga's in his 60s. He's got a lot of experience. He had a past life as, you know, who knows what. Right. Probably could be aligned with those pirates in the past. Some, oh, we know he was from, mm-hmm. we saw in the recap of this episode that it was his share of, Gordon Shard's treasure that built the tavern, right? Right. And um, so, yeah, uh, you can overthink what what gr- what grief is. You know, he was the leader of those bounty hunters, and now he's on the straight and narrow. I guess. Yeah, I mean, he's a good just way like to put you know, it. That's the price you pay for being successful. To quote Lando Calrissian. Yeah, and this you got this in your notes here. This is really what my my thing was: is the pirate nation. One of the yeah. little breadcrumbs. That was really Way interesting. Way cool. Yeah. Gorian Shard mentions the pirate nation that they, the New Republic can't even keep the mid-rim from being targeted by this. So, you know, is this a latent government? Like, what is this? We really, you know, in the in real world history, I believe there was a pirate nation established in the Caribbean for a very short amount of time, but they had rules and laws and a leader and things like that. And so it would it's not far fetched to think that they're drawing on some inspiration from this and we're probably going to see a lot more about that pirate nation. I think throughout history and a lot of fiction it it's a uh, something people talk about a lot is when an empire falls there's always these power vacuums. Yep. Yep. And warlords and pirates and and whoever else swoops in to take to seize what they can uh before the new government has a chance to put their pants on. So Right. And in this conversation with Gorian Shard, there's also a little he shot first reference sprinkled in there for good measure. So you can remember Han and Greedo. Right. Um but lots of discussion about that. But to to move through that conversation, you know, Grief is his droid offers his escape pod and he declares he is not gonna leave Navarro. He is not abandoning the city. And then they just begin the evacuation. And that is how the episode begins and we go to title card. Yeah. And so far, it really drawn me in here. I'm so pumped to see what's going to happen next. Because, I mean, like, you know, you got your trade settlement, and it doesn't have any protection at all. Not that can fend off a pirate. So, uh, I mean, there's a shortcoming there, but we don't care about that at this point. We're, <laughs> right. You know, this is the overthinker. Well, talking, we know he's right? looking for a new marshal because Cara Dune got recruited already by right, New right. Republic Special Forces, and so they needed a new lawman. Mando wouldn't take it on, and assumedly they're still in the job hunt because nobody's there to protect them. And so um, we continue to, after the title card, we roll into the main part of the episode, and we hear this really cool psychedelic rock music over this, like, kind of dusty, not run down, but also not the Taj Mahal of um, military bases where Y-Wing's coming into land and we see these shots of rebel pilots walking around. I love these shots so much. I know, aren't they good? And the music for this, it's the same, I mean, it's not the same, but it's the same setup as the cantina scene and Maz's castle and Jabba's palace and and the bar on Coruscant and just all of the bar scenes where someone would be listening to some casual like music that you know no one is listening to duel of the fates and star wars (laughs) they're they're people and so they're listening to some kind of entertaining music and this is the entertaining music that they're listening they're playing the bars yeah so it shows the bar scene they're even playing pool that's a space version of pool it's like shuffleboard on the on a on a tabletop it's really cool yeah it is cool and so we get the new republic pilot bar at adelphi and so we see in this scene um, we see you know, at, sitting at the bar for some Eagle Eyed fans, they notice some directors of The Mandalorian. We've seen Dave Filoni, Rick Fumiyawa, and Deborah Chow all sitting at the bar enjoying drinks just That's as awesome. extras. It's a really cool little shout out there. Um, but this scene is where we get the highlight of the episode for me. I mean, it was just. For everybody. I can't believe that they were able to put Zeb Aurelios into live action Star Wars. I really, I mean, 
So at the end of Rebels, he was like going off on a sabbatical, right? Yeah, he was in Lyra Son with Callus after that, um, kind of showing Callus that he hadn't killed all of the Lasats in the galaxy, um, and that's where they left it, and that was, yeah, you know, because they where found people their assumed lost he people, was right? yeah, exactly. Cool. And so now we see Zeb, and so when you see it on screen, you see the Lasat. My first reaction was. Wow, that's a cool Lasat. They did such an amazing <laughs> job with the CGI. But then he opened his mouth. And then, boom, you're like, that's Zeb! And it Steve, is just Steve amazing. Blum voiced him? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you watch Rebels, you know who it is exactly. Right, right. right? There are a lot of people I've read out there on the internet, they, they had no idea. Mm-hmm. And they had to verify with the credits, right? Right, exactly. But, but you still, see it, you know it's him. The, the CGI looks so good after... You know, some of the largest criticisms that fell on the Book of Boba Fett and on Obi-Wan Kenobi was the way that the aliens looked, the way the CGI looked, whether it was real, um, whether it was real effects or CGI, just the way that the aliens looked. They had to have spent so much money on perfecting Zeb. And it has to be, you said it in the Rav Reactions, it's because he's got to be appearing, he's going to be appearing yeah, it, on a consistent if, basis. If they're going to go put forth the effort to make this art asset, He's got to be somewhere else. Right. You know, and the technology, it gets better and better every year. It, pretty soon, it's going to be some AI making this stuff. Yep. yep. And, and you know, as far as acting goes, they're going to wear these funny hats like mm-hmm. my, Ahmed Best did. But when they do it in there, in the in what we see, it's just going to be, um, just need touch-ups and not this complete creation. It's so, the future's bright. Yeah. And it's just a cameo in this. And that's all we need. We don't need Zeb thrown into the mix right away. But it was awesome to get to see and if they can do zebrat if they can do zebrat i am so confident that they're going to be able to do hera right and then sabine and ezra and thrawn i think everybody is going to look really really good when i have a lot of we need to save a lot of discussion on this for our uh, predictions i have a lot of pontification okay all right well we'll move through we'll continue to move on so what one one quick thing i want to say about this um we take the hollow holographic transmitted messages for granted i think at this point you know between the cartoons and everything else um this is a real subtle detail but they're filoni and favreau has put together so much and are so exquisite on these small details that when grief carga sends his engineers out and everybody else and, and turns off the message from Gorin shard uh an astromech rolls up and he turns to that and so he's recording the message to send out. Right. Where right. else have you seen that? Yeah, exactly. It's a little A New Hope homage. Yes. And so, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, thank you listeners for sticking with me. But this is what I'm here for is all of these little things. I hope you're right. here with us for it, too. Yep. It sounds silly to talk about this stuff for so long. But, man, it's so cool. No, it is. It's super cool. And so in the scene, Zeb is speaking with Carson Tava, a fan favorite character. I mean... Carson Tava's role has been elevated throughout The Mandalorian because fans love him. Played by Paul Sun Young Lee, he is a fellow Star Wars podcaster. He does a Star Wars podcast. He's super involved in the fan community, and he's a good actor. And he really delivers a good performance. And so, in this episode, we spend a lot of time with his character. He and Zeb are talking about how, in light of Grief Karga's message, the New Republic needs to send help. Zeb is like, they are absolutely not going to do that. There is no way that you're going to get any help from the New Republic. And so Carson Tava says, well, I'm going to Coruscant to go and get it myself. Yeah, they won't turn me down if I'm face-to-face. Exactly. This is hope. Yeah. And so we are on Coruscant with Carson Tava. We see the skyline. We've been on Coruscant so much lately. And so we're really familiar with the planet. And one of the important things to note here that I want to touch on is in the books... In this era, in the Aftermath trilogy, if you've read those, it talks about how the Senate for the Galactic Republic is A, on Chandrilla, which is Mon Mothma's homeworld, and B, it moves around every so often. So no no planet is the seat of galactic power. Well, it's obvious that the New Republic is still, its bureaucracy is still entrenched on Coruscant. So no matter what they do, Coruscant is still going to be the heart of power in the galaxy. Yeah, yeah, you stole the words right out of my mouth. I couldn't say it better myself. It's it's the bureaucracy world. Right. And, I mean, we have all these imperial uh, liberated folks there. Um, that's probably the headquarters for all these different um, organizations, whatever arms there are. And uh, uh, from a certain perspective, it's cool to see. Yeah, no, <laughs> but it is But from cool another perspective, it's like, oh, my gosh. 
<laughs> yeah. No, it was. It was super cool to see. And so we see in the next scene a really cool live actor cameo. Not not Zeb or anything like that. We haven't spent time with this Star Wars character, but the actor is Tim Meadows, who's a really famous actor. I mean, he's in a lot of stuff. He was in Grown Ups. He was in Mean Girls. He was in Grown Ups 2. He was in Walk Hard, which I recently watched. It's a really <laughs> funny movie with John C. Riley. I mean, he normally plays a funny character, and he was playing... Not, I mean, he wasn't, like, cutting it up or anything, but he's not... It's kind of the, you know, goofy bureaucracy, like, this is how a bureaucrat's going to handle the situation. And so it's a treat to get to see Tim Meadows in the show in general. Yeah, Colonel Tuttle is his character's name, and he is flanked by Officer G68. What's her... Well, her name is Elia Kane. Elia Kane. And she is. So Tava enters the room, tries to talk with um, Colonel, say it again. Colonel Tuttle. Colonel Tuttle. And they are having a conversation about this need. And Elia Kane sees this. She recognizes Carson Tava. And she How convenient makes an excuse there. to come into the room. And she is such a snake, man. Like, now that we got to see um, Chapter 19, with her on screen. It just is so slimy. Like, I feel gross watching her on screen. You know, she's a, a, a Moff Gideon puppet. Oh, I'm skipping ahead. Predictions again. Yeah. Sure. Well, she is obviously <laughs> a Moff Gideon puppet. And so she's uh, she is just got the Imperial stink all over her. Carson Tava can tell. So when he saunters into the room, he says that he is with the Adelphi Squadron. Adelphi Rangers. Adelphi Rangers a little bit later in the episode. They're on the planet Adelphi at Adelphi Base. And we have seen this once before mentioned. I, it's twice. It, the planet was mentioned um, previously in a Mandalorian episode, but we got to go to Adelphi. We got to engage with squadrons stationed at Adelphi base in the Shadows of the Sith book that we had read You know, a few months ago. We reviewed it on this podcast. It's one of the best books in Star Wars canon, I would say. Um, fills in a lot of gaps for The Rise of Skywalker. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just, it's it's a great book. And so Luke Skywalker and Lando Calrissian <laughs> spend time at the base that we see on screen just a couple years after these events. And so it's a really, it's, they're pulling, they're, I don't know if they're pulling it from the book or if it's just a good kind of flow coincidence. Someone on the story group was like, Okay, let's say they're on this planet to kind of tie stuff together, but they did a really good job of it. So yeah, for so the thankful for that for the eagle-eyed book readers and listeners, they can really see the ties there. Um, but if you hadn't read the books, it wouldn't it wouldn't you know wouldn't limit your viewing experience in any way. But so Elia Kane walks in there and she begins freely not freely offering her opinion. She's asked by um, Colonel Tuttle for it, but she spent some time in the Outer Rim and she thinks that Navarro should you know. They don't deserve help because they're not a New Republic They didn't world. sign the charter. Exactly, because she is now such a good New Republic citizen, and she cares so much about their New Republic government. Well, and so she's just throwing a wrench into the, well, or she's gracing the machine, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. She knows how to get through this bureaucracy. She knows how to get what she wants out of this interaction. And to shut down, I mean, like, she knows something up. Navarro is a key role, mm -hmm. of which we're going to get to. Right, and yeah. Teva is sitting here speculating and saying that the Empire is involved in the planet and that there are problems on the planet. It, and that he can smell a stink on this, and he can obviously smell a stink on Elia Kane, but he's just rebuffed by the New Republic bureaucracy, and they're not going to help. Yeah. So Teva turns to his good friend Din Djarin. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just right fast, you know this this all speaks to the we've talked about a hundred times just um, how inept the New Republic is. It's in books, it's in comics, it's in this, it's in that, and it, it's just. They inherited a machine that they couldn't control, and and what was the book that we saw with Princess Leia and the Senator? And yeah, they, Bloodlines. Bloodlines. Which is an, so, another great canon yeah. book. So I'm so glad you know I could, these names just escape me. I'm so I need to do better about that, right? But the conversation they have is like, we don't want the evil of the Empire. We want the control of the Empire. Mm -hmm. And because look at look at how, you know, I mean, there's still corruption. Right. There's still uh, people who don't care about the plot of others. And this is it, this is a three minute scene. And all of this is is there because that's what, uh, gosh, Eli Kane is. She, mm -hmm. she wants that control again. Right. 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 She's part of that faction who wants the control. Mm -hmm. We don't know that at this point. But as a viewer, or the characters aren't aware of this. But as viewers, we are. Right. And it's. 
I can't wait to see this play. And it's the same as the Old Republic that we see in The Phantom Menace, that they can't control slavery on the Outer Rim. You know, well, slavery is illegal in the Republic. And it's like, yeah, that doesn't matter out here. They don't even accept Republic money out here. And so... We see that just a little in the earliest episodes of The Mandalorian where Mon, Cal, Mon Calamari Flan is accepted as currency on the Outer Rim as well as Republic credits and a dozen different other pieces of currency where in a core world it, they would only accept Republic credits. So it, it makes you admit, I wonder, you know, is that the role of the Jedi is the kind of like glue or, or um, something that what holds the whole galaxy you know the new republic had it and it wasn't as bad as or the, the old republic. republic had it and the new republic doesn't right. and, and we could have a whole podcast on which one was better for the citizenry obviously the empire wasn't right right but there's be some doofus out there who either as a joke or literally would make that argument right, right. but uh you know it'd be sacrifice you got to break a few eggs if you want to make an omelet that's the point of view of the empire right uh, terribly you know they're not eggs they're people but uh, the old Republic had the Jedi and the new Republic doesn't. Right. And, and they, they're scornful of the Jedi kind of. Mm. And well, as we've seen in bloodlines and as we even see in the sequel trilogy, that the new Republic just never really establishes their footing. Like over the 30 years that they are a governing force in the galaxy, they never really hit it. And so this is, I've got some predictions for where this takes us as far as the Outer Rim is concerned that we didn't see a lot of in the sequels. And so we'll keep moving on. Carson Tava is rebuffed by the New Republic, so he goes to his good friend Din Djarin, and he flies to the uh, Mandalorian covert planet. And you're sitting there as the viewer being like, well, I understand. Australia. Yeah, exactly. I understand why he's going here. But how is he going here? This planet is hidden. You know, Din Djarin makes it such a big deal that he's taking Bo-Katan there. I was going to say, I got a, a short comment uh, on why this is. You know, we've seen multiple times s- severely large monsters attack them. And, and I mean, like, farmers aren't going to settle this place. Miners aren't going to settle this place. It's too dangerous. You know, it, it, in other f- fiction, it's called a demon world. Right. You don't go there. You can try, but you put your whole crew at risk, and it's just not worth the effort. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mandalorians can, because they're not... They're not toiling in the dirt. Yeah, and they can they handle are those training. threats. Yeah. I mean, clearly, with just losing a few foundlings. Until until uh, <laughs> Bo Katan showed up, you know, they had to appease the beast, I guess. But yeah, so yeah. So he goes there and you're thinking, you know, how how does he know? He lands, begins speaking to an empty cave, and you can see some Mandalorians camped out on the top, ready to shoot him. He's got his hands in the air and he's, you know, I'm with the Adelphi Rangers, I'm with the New Republic, we really need your help, blah, blah, blah. And so, out saunters Paz Vizsla and a few more Mandalorians, and then comes Din. And Carson Tava is explaining his story, and Din's first question, just like the viewer, and I'm very happy that they addressed it immediately, is, how did you find us? This is hidden. We're really good at hiding. And I would be so mad at Din if I were these Mandalorians (laughs) because of that little rat droid that he brought with him. That little spy rat. No matter what happens in the next few minutes, the first order of business should have been to throw R5 into the forge. (laughs) Because (laughs) R5-D4 rats him out to the New Republic, to Carson Tava immediately. Like, no no qualms at all. And he just beep boops and comes out from behind Din. Uh, the way Tava tells it is, there's a rebel veteran amongst your ranks, and they all start looking at each other. Yeah, I wish I could see under the helmet, see their faces, just how pissed they were at these. <laughs> right. Like who? What? I mean, yeah. and it's plausible, regardless of it being R five. Sure, but he anyone just anyone can be a man. You know, if a droid can saunter up, if an astromech can saunter up, he did it right then and there. It's like, right. yep. What you gonna do about it? <laughs> I know it's so it's it's goofy in the best possible way. Like and this you, is the it is a really really good. You scene. talk about a redemption arc. Here's a character who, first we seen him, just his circuits burned up, and he didn't get to, get to go do the work he needed to do. Right, right. And and now he's a, I mean, he <laughs> he's a vet. He's like the ultimate glup show, right? Yeah, he you is. know, I, he's got more on screen time than most, I would say, yes. right? Yeah. But this is invented. This was, I mean, he was a glup show before, right? Right. And now 
he's he's got a he's got what an elevated status, right? And I'll say that I heard on a bunch of um, other podcasts or a bunch of other tweets people saying, you know, oh, Pelimoto was lying about his service just to kind no. of sell it to Dan. No. no, here at the Star Wars station, we honor our rebel heroes like R five D four. We acknowledge his service. <laughs> <laughs> we salute you, R five. Well, I tell you what, he might be. Uh, Nervous about going into a glassed out Mandalore, but I would have R five D four in my Astromech slot yeah, any day. Absolutely. So we have they we continue. Din says, you know, well now we're gonna have to move. Like no matter what happens, you're here. You know where we are. And Paz just goes, it's so this is so Paz, and it's so cold blooded. And he goes, or we can kill him. And <laughs> it's just like, come on, man, read the room here. Yeah. Like you guys are supposed to be a little bit better than that. And so Din is, no, this guy cut me. He Din doesn't even say, what's wrong with you? He just goes, no, he cut me a break one time, so we're no. going to cut him a break by sparing his life. Ultimate pragmatism. And so um, Carson Tava informs Din about Grief Karga and Navarro's problem, and he's just like, I just thought you'd like to know. I've got to go. The New Republic's not going to help. But, you know, basically Carson Tava knows that Din is a moral and honorable man. He knows he's friends with Grief and that he's going to do something about it. And so then we get to what you, you know, you said was your favorite scene of the show. And so oh, I'd love God. for you to talk about it. Oh, man. Yeah, so all the Mandalorians go back into the cave. They had their fireside chat with this talking stick. I love I, this concept It is so, so much. summer camp. They yes, are so yes. in a summer camp and with the, the talking the stick. The talking stick is, is the armor's hammer. Yep. And uh, so Din makes his case. You know, he's my friend. Uh, they helped me out in a jam. I and know we fought before. We get a verbal acknowledgement that it was many cycles, which is years in Star Wars ago, that the right. first conflict with Grief Karga happened. So we know many years. We don't five know five or many. six. I'm guessing seven? three or four. Okay, is my guess, but we don't know. We have no concrete idea, and yeah. so and a not insignificant amount of time. Exactly. And that's important because that so much has changed and we've had so many stories told in this time period that we need to know that years have passed. Right. So uh, Dan makes his case and Paz Vizsla wants to speak. And, and, and he sounds kind of critical at first. He's and, such a drama And he queen. asks, what does he ask? Uh, yeah, drama queen. Uh, I wrote down his some of his quotes. Let me find it in my notes here. Yeah, so he's talking about you know, we they died for many this died to save one thing. timely foundling. Why should we lay our lives down again? And that's the he, why he said he he emphasizes that question. Why why should we lay our lives down again? And then that pregnant pause right there because we're Mandalorians. Exactly, and it's a really rousing speech. It's really good. Yeah, and I want to say that. So this scene, all the Mandalorians are talking. Like you said, there's the pregnant pause. So it, it's a lot like the scene in Rogue One where they're all sitting around the dais. They found out about the Death Star, and they're like, what are we going to do? And Jin's giving her speech. Jin delivers her whole take, and then some guy in the back goes, what is she proposing? And I just <laughs> thought that guy was going to scream that in the middle of Paz's pause, just like they did in Jin's. I mean, this was this episode was just, I really laughed at this episode in a really good way because of the way that it felt like it was calling back to other Star Wars things. But you're right. The speech literally is super rousing. It makes sense. It's You hear Paz and you're like, this is so in character for him. He's going to divide the Mandalorians on this issue. This is ridiculous. But then he really hits home on how now we know that he trusts Din. Now we know he trusts Bo-Katan. And they put their lives on the line for his son. And as a Mandalorian, they are all about going to war, all about putting their lives on the line. And this is just the important message that he's putting together. Because we've got the four leaders of the group, Bo, Din, Paz, and the Armorer. And so with all of them united, no Mandalorian is going to dissent. Yeah, from a warfighter's perspective, which I'm not saying I am. You know, I, I went to Kuwait. I went to Iraq. I've seen a lot, done a lot of things. I was a comms guy, just to be clear. But... You know, that didn't mean I didn't see stuff. So from a warfighter's mindset, if all you train to do is fight and you get an opportunity to fight, it's, you know, it'd be one thing. It's like, oh, we need to fight a literal legion of uh, dark troopers. Well, that'd give you some pause, right? Right. Um, there's 50 pirates out here causing a ruckus. Right. Okay, let's go have ourselves a shootout, guys. Exactly. This is just fun for them. They're just having a good old time fighting these pirates. And I mean, that's what these people live for. Yeah. Right. That's what they train for. That's, that's what they all train they for. want to do. And so this is this is an easy 
task for them to accomplish. I mean, it's not easy. Literally, they are they are outnumbered. They have, uh, as Bo-Katan explains in the next scene, and the ship is called a Cumulus class Corsair, based off, I guess, a Cumulus cloud. And uh, what is the what is the type of ship she has? We find out specifically. Yeah, it's uh, the Cormac Fighter Transport, which right. is a Mandalorian class of ship that it's called we've the seen Gaunt. in. Yeah, hers specifically is named. We find the out Gaunt. later in this episode, but yeah, so they set out. It's really cool. People remarked how cool it was. Was it this scene where the ships come out of hyperspace? Oh, it's so so we normally get ships coming out of hyperspace from the front perspective. So they come out of hyperspace and then they kind of slow down a lot. Well, coming at it from the back, we see the star streak and they just look like they're going so fast into the planet. I mean, really, if <laughs> if this was a realistic, not in Star Wars show, they'd be playing Danger Zone right here because right, that's exactly right. what it looks like. <laughs> um, and right before that and in hyperspace, Bo is laying out the plan. She's telling everybody what they need to do. She is so clearly displaying her leadership capability that look, Din is a good leader. He does not have the history of leadership like Bo Katan. And we just see her as a veteran Mandalorian really displayed throughout this episode. Right. And these scenes are so fun. Uh Din shows himself first. They start he starts fighting and jousting with the uh Corsair. Right. They launch their snub fighters. And Vane is such a pilot in one is Vane. <laughs> he's such a baby. Like this guy is Vane is, I'm gonna get you. He's so mad the whole time. Uh, he's, he's just he's so butthurt at, at Mando. It's ridiculous. If you look up the phrase chip on his shoulder, Vane's pictures there scowling exactly. at you the whole time. <laughs> and these pirates are goofy in the best way. Like they are they are over the top. They are like pirates, like we imagine them. And right. it's a good thing. They did a fantastic job, and especially so you said Pirates, as you'd imagine him, the the Gorin Shard is this moss monster. I wouldn't call right. him Swamp Thing, right? That's a DC comics. We won't go there. No, right. it's Marvel. Shut my mouth. No, uh, Swamp Thing's DC. Is it? Man Thing is the Marvel version, oh. but Swamp Thing's the famous DC version. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he's a he's a moss monster is what I'm going to call him. We got to differentiate, right? right? Who is his little sidekick? <laughs> and Ugnot, that looks almost exactly like Smee from Captain Hook. Disney properties, right? Right. You <laughs> pointed that out to me. That they got him from the Peter Pan look there. I mean, it's... Go back and he's look. Got, he's at got this a striped guy. shirt, a little, a little skull cap on. You know, yeah. it's really cool. And he's he's short in stature and pudgy. Yeah, he, he kind of acts like Shmi. <laughs> he's he's funny. Um, it was a good little homage. You're right. Um, and so, like you said, we've got Mando flying around, shooting at the snub fighters. They're he's absolutely out. a match. Totally dominating. Them. He is destroying. It, it, it's them. Maverick versus uh, newbie pilots. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so he's flying around, taking all these shots, but he's dodging everything. He makes two snub fighters crash into each other. And if you're just a fan of Star Wars space battles or Star Wars fighters, um, you know, dog fights, like these, this season of Mando is the season for you because it, it happens so and many times. And we have more to come. And you saw all those in, uh, interceptors. I know. People gripe about the, um, about Din's gunship, about the Razor Crest being gone. And I get it. You can't bounty hunt in the N1. Din is beyond that. He is no longer a bounty hunter. I mean, that may be his profession when he gets audited by the New Republic tax <laughs> entity, but he's not a bounty hunter anymore. He is a hero. Like, that's his profession, basically. It, it changed when he got the Darksaber. Yeah, His exactly. role changed, and, and when he had a foundling, mm -hmm. you know, he was elevated. Before, he was just another member of the of the troop. Right. And so he's no different than guy with the white stripe on his blue helmet, green chest plate. Right. And he's got to <laughs> like, you got to provide for your family. You got to go out and get dinner. Yep, exactly. Earn that bread. But now he's, he's elevated. Like yeah. you said, he's, he's, he's a senior leader. He's got his child to worry about. He's got the dark saber and all the weight that that carries figuratively and literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so he's got, so in the end one, we get so, we just get scenes we never could have gotten. And this, this, these sequences, this season, couldn't have worked with the Razor Crest. Like, they had good foresight in eliminating the Razor Crest. I'm not saying it's not an iconic ship for Mando, but really the N1 serves a different purpose and is so unique that I'm a big fan of it. So we continue through these combat scenes. The Corsair then begins to pursue Din. It's just the N1 versus this giant corvette of a ship. And so it's coming, it's firing all kinds of lasers at him. And this is when we get the dropship scenes from the yes. Mandalorian trailer. Bo-Katan in her Cormac class fighter. It's really cool. Yeah, they drop down into the city and just take these guys apart. 
It is so fun to see. It really is. I mean, it's phenomenal to see. Um, it's the Mandos drop in. They start chopping the pirates up. And you've got the Anzellans. Again, love the Anzellans. This this episode was just made for me. It's got rebels. It's got Babu Frick species. I mean, Cro- they said, what are we going to do to make Carter love the Mandalorian <laughs> more than he already does? We're going to make this episode. And so we see the Anzellans rooting on the Mandos. And we just get some good, old-fashioned Mando, large groups of Mando combat scenes that we haven't seen since Rebels or the Clone Wars. Yeah, these are organized fighters going against rabble and they just tear these guys to pieces. And, and then at one point they get pinned down, forget that they have their jet packs and can just jump away. They get sandwiched between two different, uh, power groups. Right. Right. And, and then, and, and another point, the croaky and monkey lizards, or, yeah, they're approaching an ambush and the croaky and monkey lizard, lizard snitches them out, yeah. <laughs> snitches the pirates out yes. to the mandos. Yeah, they do. And so, then the pirates mount uh, basically what's an e-web. It's not an e-web, but same thing. Onto the balcony. Cruiser weapon. Um, and so they're sitting there firing at the Mandalorian's suppressive fire. And we just have the armorer saunter in. She has no blasters. All she has is her best guard tools, her tongs, and her hammer. And she goes to town on these guys. I mean, it is pretty brutal. There's no blood. It's a Star John Wars. Wick scene. It is a John Wick scene, though. That's exactly right. Because she pulls a body. She pulls somebody in front of them, and the pirates unload on their friend. Right. And just whacks people with that hammer. You yeah. know, it's like whack-a-mole. And he's like, Throws the tongs across k-thunk, k-thunk. the room. And just imagine getting hit with a sledgehammer that was just thrown across a room in the head. You're dead, one. Two, it just looks so cool. And so Pain, she takes him out dead. easily. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh Having, having your skull bashed in with a hammer, I'm sure, is extremely painful. You don't, you don't sure. die right away. <laughs> <laughs> not right away, but you're not making it. Um, and so the armor is super good. Then, you know, the pirates are outnumbered, outgunned. They're trying to flee. And then the village people, not the band, but the people of Navarro, <laughs> come and stop them at the gate with their limited weapons. Really, it just looks like Grief's the only one with the blaster. Everyone else is, like, holding sticks and pikes and stuff right they're pitchforks basically vane has abandoned gorin shard too he says he says something comical <laughs> right here doesn't yeah. he? well he's like i i don't remember what his exact lines are but he's trying to get out of there and he flies away and oh he tells gorin shard that their relationship has come to an end yeah and it just feels like he's running away like skeletor and he's like, <laughs> i'll get you next time mando and it's just it's a really good scene yeah. Um, and it's just, he's it, going to be back. It feels like the, you know, they talk about how Mando is like, um, playing with action figures, kind of figuring out all that. It's, you know, it's got the serial vibe. It's like the Saturday morning cartoon. This was the Saturday morning cartoon yeah. moment. Um, but Vane's going to be back because like Carson Tava alluded to, and like we see throughout the episode, the pirates have some kind of relationship with Moff Gideon and that's where Vane has to be going. Right. Um, and so... Plus he's a coward. Yeah, plus he's a coward. So, Gorian Shard can see the writing on the wall. This is over. He's, you know, they're done. And so, what's he going to do? Is he's going to kill everybody in Navarro. He begins firing the bubble turrets at the villagers. Just the cluster, not even the city. And it's almost there. And Mando and bo take the Corsair out by targeting its last engine at the exact same time. And we get this awesome shot. Of the Corsair just crashing into Navarro. Massive explosion. Gorian Shard screaming. It's a really cool scene. Yeah, it's a shame. That ship would have been a good base for the Mandalorians. Yeah, or it transport was. Or but there is nothing left nothing of that left. thing. Um, I'm sure there will be. Next time we see Navarro, there's got to be in the background on those on those hills. There's going to be a cra- the crashed ship, the the wreckage of it. Someone's living in it or some yeah, Kawakian monkey lizards there. are there. Something's happening there. The school, the new school the new will be school, in, yeah. the, in the crashed ship. Um, and so that's the end of the battle. Grief Karga is giving a speech to his citizens and to the Mandos. And he says that he's going to grant from the Lava Flats to a different portion of land that Bullock, I do not remember. Bullock Fields, Bullock something. Bullock Fields. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, Bullock somethings to the Mandalorians as their tract of land. Basically, this is new Mandalore. It's not, obviously, it's not literally new Mandalore. They still want Mandalore. And this is, Navarro is, if you look at a galactic map, extremely far from Mandalorian space. Like, on the opposite end of the galaxy from Mandalore. But, this is an extremely important detail for the Mandalorians. They now have a home. They now have a place that they can call their own. They don't have to hide anymore. 
They are protecting Navarro, and Navarro is a big enough settlement and city and trade place, trade route, that they are going to be have a symbiotic relationship, and, basically. And resume a quote-unquote normal life. Right. What, you know, Dan said it in his speech early in the episode, uh, our children can play in the sun. Yes, exactly. Which is, as, as we've seen, the children on the watch care so much about the foundlings. That's all they really want is to be able to revive and re-raise Mandalorian culture. And, and, and the fact is, Mandalorians... Yes, they are literally all fighters and stuff, but that's just the same as every Marine is a rifleman. They have their own specialization. We saw it on Sundari. And, right. I mean, there's architects. There's uh, Sabine's father is an artist. Yeah, all these other things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and so, I, you know, season four of Mandalorian is probably going to have some really cool looking stuff going on. In there. Yes, absolutely. So then we get Paz telling Bo-Katan the armorer would like to speak to you. They go to the old forge, and the armor is giving this analogy about the great forge in Mandalore and how it made all the armor. And e- but even this little forge served its purpose. And this is the this is the analogy of Mandalore versus Navarro. That Navarro is not Mandalore, but it is their new home, just as that was their new forge. And then, why does the armor got to be so sketchy and so mysterious? And she's like, "Hey, take your helmet off." And you're just, as the viewer, you're like, what? And then as Bo-Katan, she's like, what, what are you talking about? And she's like, take your helmet off. And bo She says, do you respect my station? Exactly. bo that's not the way. And she says, do you respect my station? And bo will like, uh, yeah. And so she nervously takes her helmet off. And you're the whole time like, what is the armorer's game here? Like, yeah, yeah. She wants to excommunicate bo You know, we're all, every, viewers are all skeptical from all this Mandalore past history. Right. And she's got the little spikes on her helmet, right? And so, well, the armor is not giving the viewers of, much reason to trust her because right. she's so mysterious. She hasn't right. done anything overtly bad, but she has not done anything that has been like you have gained our full trust, right? And I'm I'm just sitting here thinking this is this is some sort of treachery fixing to happen here. Yeah, exactly. But it wasn't. This was the armorer telegraphing to Bo-Katan and showing her. You know, she has walked both ways. She has walked the way. And she is her own Mandalorian. She was a Mandalorian before the you know these children of the Watch were doing their thing, and because she saw the Mythosaur, this is proof that she has walked both ways, and that this is a new age for Mandalore. And, and what so does this new age mean? It means that we must walk the way together. Exactly. And so, so the Armorer is ready to get all of the Mandalorian diaspora across the galaxy united behind Bo-Katan, which is no small task. Uh, the armor says, you saw the mythosaur. It is a sign the next age is upon us. You are the one who can unite us. Exactly. And so bo is there to bring together all the Mandalorians. The armorer is basically saying, you are going to be the Mandalorian leader. We've already tried this twice. Third time's the charm for bo um, The armor doesn't say that, but that's what we as the viewer know, is that this is her third start at leadership of the Mandalorians. But because she saw the mythosaur and because of her experiences... She is the most suited for the job. And so she's sending Bo-Katan away. She's sending Bo-Katan away without her mask to go and find find different Mandalorians. And we know of Sabine's out there. Finn Rao is out there. The rest of her cadre. The rest of her crew is out there. There are just got to be more Mandalorians out there that we haven't even seen. The Mandalorians just take in other people all the time. Like there is that we are building a Mandalorian army here. It is going to be, it's super cool. I'm really, really excited to see where the rest and, of this is And the is armor going. even mentions that they want to retake Mandalore. Yes, exactly. She does. She says that explicitly. Now is the time, but they've got to gather their forces. And so what, I'm, what I will say is that there have been people who have been complaining about the pacing of this season or been complaining about the lack of a unified vision for the season because Din had to go to the mines and then we had the Coruscant episode and blah, blah, blah. Well... I've kind of thought from the beginning that this is where it was headed. Not explicitly Bo-Katan was going to unite because she saw the Mythosaur. Yeah, we this, all thought it was going to be Din Djarin. But this season was about uniting Mandalore. And that was pretty much the thought from the beginning. And so we have finally gotten, for the complainers out there, and for the people who have not felt like that has been clear, this has been explicitly stated that this is the point of the season now, is Bo-Katan is going to unite the Mandalorians. And... Katie Sagoff is builds a co-lead on this. I mean, it's not even just Pedro Pascal's show. She is the second name under Pedro Pascal. And so it's clear. This is also Katie Sackoff's story. This is also Bo-Katan's story. Right, yeah. And it's and there's a lot more to it. Uh, 
we I want to save it for their predictions. Yeah. Because man, we got they're, a lot they're of not going to unite Mandalore without some hiccups along the way. Yeah, and so Bo Katan is paraded out by the armor in front of all the Mandalorians. They all again, you can only see their helmets, but they by, through their body language, they're all super sketched out because yeah, she's walking back. around without her helmet. Um, and then the armorer just says. She has walked both ways. She's going to unite Mandalore. Paz kind of gives Din a look, and Din acknowledges that this is a good thing. This is a fact, just through a nod. And, you know, Din, Din must not have any hurt feelings that he had to go, that he took his helmet off, and then he had to go on this quest, and now bo allowed to do it. But my question for this is, what does the Darksaber even mean anymore, if they're just saying so, bo is now their leader? I've been pondering that, and what and I'm going to jump ahead just slightly. I'm thinking this is going to be like some sort of uh, royalty regent mm-hmm. slash prime minister okay. situation. See, like a, I'm 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 on the same page that in the distant future, season six, seven of the Mandalorian, we're get this isn't really predictions because this is so far fetched speculation, but that we could see Bo-Katan, like you said, as the royal, and then Din more as like the. Prime he's minister, prime president. minister, but not even in that way. To me, it seems more like he is the like white knight of the Mandalorians. Like, he is this military leader of theirs. Like, he is their... Commandant, a marshal or commandant. He is the high... He is the high military leader of the Mandalorians. But this is all speculation. So, there's a little bit more of the episode. It really feels like it could end here, but it doesn't. We come back to an X-Wing floating through space, and we see a derelict Lambda-class shuttle also floating through space. The X-Wing is Carson Tavas. He pulls up and he gets a New Republic person on the on the comm and he says, hey, found an abandoned ship. They say, yeah, there's an abandoned ship in the area, but it's classified, the information around it. And it's like, who classified this is the first question that we don't get answered. He sends a probe into the ship and you can see that there are all these dead New Republic officer bodies floating around. There's a giant chunk out of the Lambda class shuttle and... The, Moff Gideon's corpse is not there. Well, they get the, they look for the um, travel data. Yes, and then they figure out, oh, this was the exact same time. Moff Gideon shuttle left, puts two and two together. Moff Gideon has escaped trial. We've gotten lip service to that a couple times, so now we have it confirmed that that's what happened. And then, at the very end, we get the scan of the Lambda class shuttle, and they detect Beskar alloy in there. And they're like, why would the Mandalorians do this? Well, Cut the, to credits. The person on the other, the other end of the comms yeah, made that exactly. comment. Carson Tava doesn't. And so, this is the, the water best car in the wall is our exact transition into our prediction segment, because it's going to be a long one. It's going to be a big one. Always in motion. Difficult to see. Always in motion is the future. So, Colin, we have a lot to speculate about right here. The first bit of speculation that we really got to get to because it's the very cliffhanger is where is this Beskar from? Why is this Beskar in the shuttle? Who has put this Beskar here? And I've got a lot of thoughts about it, but I want to know what you think it could be. So it's a it's a couple things. It's an obvious implication against Mandalorians, but it's a Beskar alloy. And um, yeah, it's just a little piece. It's like a square of it. It doesn't look like it's a piece of a weapon or anything. Right. So something was shot and flew off. I mean, we saw um, Bo-Katan's shoulder pad fall off. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, it's not implausible that a Mandalorian could have been there and in an altercation had some sort of issue. Right. Um, so there's that's maybe the um, New Republic is going to keep a closer eye on the Mandalorians and figure out what's going on. Right. It could be that Bo-Katan's crew is out there doing their thing somehow, looking for revenge on him somehow. Mm-hmm. I'm really averse to the concept of the New Republic and Mandalorians fighting. I mean, they can have friction. I think that's totally fine and normal. I would hate to see on-screen like combat between them, though. I don't want to see that, at least in this stage of the Mandalorians, because I think that presents too many problems for... The wider universe. Here. Right. Um, but I think that that Beskar, there's a lot of options. It could be Imperials employing Beskar that they've stolen, that they just liberated him, but now we have Imperials adorned in Beskar, um, like Imperial Super Commandos from Rebels or something even different from that. It could have just been planted there by the Imperials to frame the Mandalorians, like you said. Or I think the most plausible answer is that it's Bo-Katan's rogue group, except my question is... 
Bo-Katan's rogue group liberated Gideon like that, why wouldn't they just kill him? And why would they go to all this trouble to kill all these New Republic officers? I know that they don't think the trial would be justice. They would obviously not think that that is right, that he's going to a New Republic tribunal that we've seen, you know, they want to give pardons, things like that. They probably wouldn't have pardoned Gideon, but the Mandalorians don't think he would have gotten a harsh enough sentence. But why would they? Why would they just not kill him? Like this yeah. would just mean that man, that Moff Gideon is dead. That's what leads me to think it's not the Night Owls. Yeah. Another good question I've heard people talk about is uh, the Dark Troopers were made of a Beskar alloy, supposedly. You know, they could they could take hits from blasters. Uh, supposedly, Luke had to hit him in soft points in the hallway. It wasn't just easy for him to cut through. And I mean, true for Luke, literally. But <laughs> you know. But for, for blasters, it wasn't going to be an easy task. Right. right. Um, and so... If, well, we saw all the trouble Den had with even one, and his Beskar spear bounces off of its armor. Right. So it could be that a, a group of dark troopers liberated and a chunk flew off one of them into the wall. Right, right. And all, so... Uh, all are equally plausible. Yeah, we have no idea. It's just a lot of speculation right here. Um, and so we have with with running with Bo-Katan's night owls we know that they're in this season the promotion has had axe woves helmet it's had um gosh i am so remiss to forget her name right here um but Bo-Katan's oh Koska Reeves Koska Reeves um we've had their helmets and promotional t- material for this episode or not for this episode for this season so we know they're coming into play likely in the next episode because the next episode is, by my prediction and by all logic, will be bo centered episode. Because not only is that the logical setup for the next episode, we already saw they jumped over to Coruscant, but Bryce Dallas Howard is directing the next episode. She was the one who knocked it out of the park with the season two episode, The Heiress, which is where we got introduced to bo So Bryce Dallas Howard is a director is super familiar with handling Bo-Katan's character, and this is probably going to be the most Bo-Katan-centric episode of The Mandalorian we've probably gotten at all. Yeah, that's going to be great. I, I, I'm i looking forward to it. And so my, my thought here is that to unite these Mandalorians, her Mandalorians are not going to believe her about the Mythosaur, is my prediction. And they have already, and it's already been stated, they're going to listen to the Darksaber. So I think this is Bo-Katan's excuse at the beginning of next episode to bring Din along. The Din's going to tag along. We're not going to get a whole episode just following Bo-Katan around. Din's going to be there. He's going to be involved in the recruitment as the wielder of the Darksaber and as the main character of the TV show. <laughs> yeah, and Grogu too. He, you know, Gro- this past episode wasn't much of a Grogu episode where a lot a of the other ones Grogu, have. For sure. But he was there, you know. He wasn't back on Space Australia with all the other foundlings. <laughs> right, exactly. He was sitting in Den's lap like he always is. Um, and so it's just there's nothing for Grogu to do in these Starfighter fights. Like he just he just has to sit there. They need a little they need to develop Grogu, get him a little older, and then install a gun turret on that in one right. and allow That's Grogu right. to Grogu to be a gunner. Um but anyway, it's uh so we're gonna have, I think, Mando tag along with Bo next episode. And We're still missing two scenes from the trailer, which surprises me because Disney in the past, almost all of the scenes, first one, two, three episodes, we're about to be in episode six of this season and we're still missing two scenes from the trailer. Droid Cantina and what else? Droid Bar and the scene. And this scene is absolutely in the next episode. There's, I mean, I would bet anyone, any money that this scene is in the next episode. And it's the Cormac class fighter flying above, um, the Mandalorian domed cities with the green grass all around. Right. And we haven't seen that. We saw basically the same shot replicated on Mandalore, but it was bombed out Sindari and the glass planet. This is intact ones with grass around them. Yeah. And so we don't, we haven't seen that shot yet. We haven't seen the droid bar. And so I think they'll both probably come up next episode. I'm not sure how the droid bar will even play into this. I don't even know if I could speculate because I thought it would be Navarro. Yeah. Um, Oh, who knows? Probably a cutscene. That's where my money's going to be on the droid bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, and I'll say the last thing on my speculation about tomorrow's episode is it's going to be a certified banger for one main reason, and that it is the Wednesday before Celebration. It'll come out. Celebration is the two days after that. It's on Friday. 
Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And they want, I mean, they're going to want the convention buzzing. People are going to have to be, t- there's going to be a massive cliffhanger next episode. Much bigger than the cliffhanger with the, collu- we with the conclusion in the other two. Yes, exactly. And so I think that we're definitely going to get something really good next week. Yeah, so I, I think th- my prediction is a Moff Gideon reveal. You know, we, they've built a lot up to him. We're going to find out what Dr. Pershing has to do with any of this stuff. Uh, what's her name? The the Eliah Kane. Eliah Kane. They're, they're going to tip her hand on what role she's playing in all this. And And the reason I say all this stuff is... I believe that uh, Moff Gideon is in league with the pirates somehow. You know, he's just, at this point, uh, an imperial brand of a pirate, literally. So, uh, and he has a seething hatred for Mandalorians of any stripe. Yes. You know, uh, for whatever reason, I'm sure it started before. You know, in whatever Moth Gideon comic we finally get is going to be why he doesn't like Mandalorians so much. Maybe they kicked his puppy when he was a kid or something. Well, and we know he was the Moth over their sector, and it was so brutal to them. Right. And so we saw earlier in the season where they lured uh, Bo-Katan Kryze away from her castle, and whoever the Imperial bad guy was destroyed the castle. And um, I think this is... Uh, the attack on Navarro was to specifically attract Mandalorians to out of hiding. He, I don't think he could find them. Mm-hmm. And so now they're going to be on Navarro and Vane is out there lurking. So he's going to go snitch. Right. And, or, or they'll just send whatever patrol their way and find, and find them. And there's going to be a clash between Moff Gideon's forces and the Mandalorian forces. Mm-hmm. And I mean, let me be specific. Whoever's going to be on Mandalore is going to be rescued, attacked by Moff Gideon's forces, mm-hmm. and attack and, and, and Bo-Katan with the rest of her forces are going to come save the day. Interesting. Okay. See, so what I thought, where I thought you and might that be going, that could be in the next two episodes. I don't know. Sure. But we're going to end up on Mandalore somehow. Yeah, absolutely. I thought you may might be going to Bo-Katan and Mando are going to be gone. Maybe even Paz is going to be gone, and then the. Other Mandalorians are going to get attacked on Navarro by Imperial forces. That's what I mean, yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And so they'll have to come back to save them. Yeah, I think that's super plausible. I really could see that happening. Um, And the last thing I'll say on my speculation is this is far speculation. This isn't even for the series speculation. This is more wider implications at the end of the series is that when you look at where Navarro is on a map and you look at Mandalore and you look at how far apart they are, Hut space has existed in Star Wars for a really long time. It's this independent section of the galaxy ruled by the Huts, not a part of the Republic at any point, not a part of the Empire. I mean, the Empire was had its free reign over it, but the Hut space Hut was still independent somewhat. I think that during the time of the sequels, we might have just it wasn't mentioned in the movies, but there's no reason it couldn't exist. Is a vein of the outer rim running from Mandalore to Navarro, which is a big chunk of the galaxy that might be Mandalorian space, that is now we ha- kind of have three competing governments around this time. And that's just wild speculation. But that's where I see, just based on galactic geography, that's where I see this going. Yeah, it's it's quite the deal. Uh, I like that concept a lot. Uh, that is a l- long, far out thing, but it's definitely plausible. So a couple of little predictions. You know, we got some left on the table. Uh Grogu received his rondelle last episode. He's going to get shot in that. Totally going to get shot in the chest. And yeah. um, we're going to see how that plays out. Uh, what else? So the, you know, the Moff Gideon thing has been built up so much, and it's going to be there's some sort of uh, bureaucratic failure within the New Republic that's going to lead to, you know, the New Republic guys. Are, you think Zeb's going to come back, or is he just a one-off? Zeb will certainly come back in Ahsoka. I do not know if he'll be coming back in this show. I think that might have just been to kind of give us a little tease of Ahsoka. I mean, unless the New Republic gets involved heavily, like Zeb has no reason to go on this crusade. I do think his introduction means that we'll get Sabine in this season of Mandalorian. Well, so many other fans out there of this show are salivating for Thrawn. Yeah. So bad. I think that's a stretch. It could be a final scene thing. Well, we've to seen lead the us end credit Ahsoka, scenes right? on all of these, and I think that's what it is. I think yeah. it'll be an end credit scene. And so, um, 
I mean, that's that's it. But as far as him being the big bad imperial guy, I don't think so in this. Yeah. I think it's Moff Gideon. I agree. They would have teased it somehow other way. But at the same time, we saw the Pergils. We saw it. We've seen Zeb. I wonder what else. Does that mean anything or is it just throwing a bone? Is it just fan service? No, it's it's the last bit of this. It's the second to last episode is also written by Dave Filoni. And so I think they'll spend some time in episode seven of this season working on the setup for the Ahsoka show. It's not going to be the whole season. It's also the penultimate episode. And so they're going to have to set up the finale for this season. It's going to chiefly be about Mandalore. But let's say this episode has 45 to 50 minutes of runtime. Ten of those minutes, spaced out, are going to be dedicated to the setup for the Ahsoka show, Zeb, Sabine, Pergils, any other, you know, concept that we need for the Ahsoka show. So we're being extremely optimistic here. And and I hope this I hope we get a conclusion at the end of this season. You know, at the end of season two, it concluded in a very good way. And of course we got season two point five in Book of Boba right. Fett. Right. But Mandalore was or uh, the Mandalorian was disgraced. He was an apostate, right? And he had to go redeem himself. And our predictions were way were mine. I know I remember mine. I don't remember what yours were, but I thought it was going to take all season for him to get redeemed. What we knew was going to happen, but how it happened was really cool. And so um, I'm hoping for a good I'm hoping for a good confrontation with the Imperial bad guy. I'm hoping a good lead in, lead in into Ahsoka. But if history says anything, there's a lead in into season into the next season in, in, into this season four. Do you have any predict? I mean, it's usually something not positive. It's some problem that they have to go solve. So what do you think? I mean, any speculation as to what that could be? Yeah, I don't think that Mandalore gets taken in these next three episodes. There's just, I don't think there's enough time for them to have the grand victory of we got Mandalore back. There'll be some reason that they weren't able to get Mandalore and we will get Mandalore early in season four with a new threat develop. Yeah. That's my prediction. Um, I I just don't know. I It seems over the top, but like I said, we he was redeemed in the first two episodes. And, and something's got to come about with that mythosaur. I think my casual, silly prediction is Grogu's going to be the one to tame the mythosaur. Yep. And 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 my foundation for that is uh, Grogu is has some attunement with beasts, like like select Jedi do mm-hmm. throughout all the mm-hmm. all the stories. Like right? Ezra does. Like Ezra does. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, I, whereas I think it makes logical sense, it, it doesn't make literal sense <laughs> right and we'll see how they get it done because well, i don't he, think he, you're wrong i think that you're probably closer than you imagine he is a mandalorian though so um so colin that wraps up always in motion we had a big prediction segment right here um but we have a new segment that is not gonna come up super often but is gonna come up today it's really exciting um we alluded to it in the intro and that's that there's a new TV show that came out, a new Star Wars show, not targeted at us. It comes not, out on May 4th. The show comes out on May 4th. They've released three shorts in um, preparation for the show, and it's not focused on us at all. Um, it's not targeted at adults. We are not going to do coverage of these episodes in the same way that we do coverage of The Mandalorian or even The Bad Batch. Um, but it's a kid's show, and it's for younger kids. I mean, it's it's geared towards um, that like Disney junior age. And so it's called The Young Jedi Adventures. It follows three younglings being trained by Master Yoda at a Jedi temple um, and a non-Force-sensitive pilot kid that... Where are her parents? Yeah, Kai, <laughs> Kai Brightstar, Liz, and Nubs. Exactly. <laughs> um, and Nubs is awesome. Um, but anyway, so we took a look at these three shorts. They're three minutes long. They're on YouTube. I did it on my lunch break one day. But your son, Charlie, also took a look at these three shorts. Yeah, he was engrossed. He... He says he didn't like it. He says it's boring, but he's at that age. But I, I pinned him down. I said, because he, he wants to, he's very active. He wants to go do this and that. And if I interrupt what he's doing, he, he, he's going to be, he, he's a typical child, you know, in public. Children act perfectly in public. Almost all children do. 
but they have a special relationship with their parents, so they're going to be counter to what a parent wants. So I pinned him down, and I want to play a little clip for you. He he loved the lightsaber fights, and he loves Baby Yoda. To him, any of Yoda's species is Baby Yoda because he's small. Now, I was even trying to talk about it. I got confused. Right. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, it's super cute. It's super fun. I think the show has a lot of potential. I've watched all the shorts. Um, the characters are fun. I think it's Disney rolling the dice with the nubs character to see how if they can get another Grogu out of it. Right, right. And um, But even the side character was Nash and her little droid. Looks like the top of a BB-8 droid is a lot of fun. Um, but it's a typical kid show. It's it's hard to watch from adults. I, you know, get your little cousin or your little child and put them on your lap and <laughs> right. enjoy it. There's my, your excuse to watch it. So yeah. you don't have to sit down and watch it and, as an adult. It's actually fun. I think they did a really good job that in the first little short, all the little characters introduce themselves and fight uh, a practice droid that has three lightsaber-like weapons and like a vibroblade or something. And it reminds me a lot of a General Grievous thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It was. It was a neat little show. And so let's hear a little bit of Charlie's audio right now. Truly wonderful, the mind of a child is. Do you remember that Star Wars cartoon you watched? Yeah. Um, my um, favorite part was when, when they were fighting. Fighting with what? Fighting with lightning. My favorite part is the baby Yoda. Well, that was actual Yoda, not Baby Yoda. I like Baby Yoda. I just call him Baby Yoda because he's my favorite Baby Yoda. And that was my son, Charlie. Uh, he's the light of my life along with my daughter. They're so fun. I'm so watching them grow and loving Star Wars. He says it's boring, but I sat there and watched him watch the whole thing, and he he loved it. So yeah. whatever. <laughs> He was engrossed, you said, and I believe you. And it's from the sound bite. It sounds like he still had parts that he liked. And so when the show comes out, we'll have to get back from a report from Charlie. Yeah. Um, the only thing I will say that I got out of the shorts was that the new Jedi Temple, which it's brand new. It's on a new planet, new temple. It looks great. The design is super cool. Like, it's visually pleasing. Looks like a Jedi Temple. Super in tune with nature. That part was awesome. Yeah, we love seeing new planets. It's like Tanuki or something. Yeah, I have no idea. I do not remember. Oh, it also takes place during the High Republic era. For anyone reading, yeah, yeah, High I was Republic fixing to books. say I, these. I sure hope these kids didn't get Order sixty six. Right, they made it through <laughs> all that. They they were well dead by that time. Um, but it is for any of you High Republic fans. It takes place during that era, and so that's cool. Um, and we don't know how long Nub species lives. Maybe Nubs was a Jedi master during the Clone War. Um, but that's enough uh, talking about the young Jedi adventures because we've got another big segment for you guys today. We have a lot of Holonet news to cover. Just because Celebration is around the corner doesn't mean that we don't have news to talk about right now. So we're going to hop into the Holonet news segment. You made the Holonet. So Colin, our first news story today is um, some more film rumors. In a bunch of our last episodes, we've talked about film rumors. The two news stories are going to go hand in hand. We'll start with this one. And the new rumor on the street is, is we're not getting two films announced at Celebration, but that we are going to get a third film announced at Celebration. No indication if this is a trilogy or not, but that they are supposedly announcing three films. And in addition to that, and this is a rumor, I want to put this out there with a big grain of salt because nobody knows and these headlines happen all the time. But the rumor is that if there's not a Star Wars movie by 2025, Kathleen Kennedy no longer has a job, which is already weird because her contract expires this year anyway. And so all the all the buzz before that was she's not going to renew her contract, not because Disney, but because she's going to retire. She's, you know, she's done. almost 70 years old. Exactly. And so but the word is that she wants to continue. But that if there's not a movie in theaters by 25, no job. Yeah, uh, I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> we've had our own private discussions we probably don't need to get into that too much but uh you know i think after our long discussion in our last episode the deciding factor on if a trilogy is good or not or over time has redeeming value is time yep and so if we don't get a movie you know 
if we get one, we're not getting one this year. We're not getting one next year. Right. 2024 is right. the earliest. 25 is the earliest. Well, even better, but I'm not opposed to 2026 even. Yeah. If we have to wait so the film is good, I don't mind. I, it, I hate that the rumor is that if there's not one out, this is going to happen because I don't want a rush job. I don't want them to say, we're making a movie so she doesn't lose her job. Right. And to talk about Kathleen Kennedy for a moment, she has done some great things at Lucasfilm. She's an executive producer on Mandalorian. She's an executive producer on Andor. She's an executive producer on all the TV shows. Well, and her past history is really good, too. And I think the Indiana Jones movie is going to be good. But you cannot ignore that a Star, Star Wars movie is having so many stops and starts, having so many issues surrounding the directors and surrounding the producers and surrounding the writers and just all of the all that goes into making a movie and... All of the Star Wars movies have, had, have been rocky. Even the ones that got made, even Rogue One changed writers, Solo changed directors. I mean, we've had all of this. Uh, the, the Rise of Skywalker changed writers. People forget The Force Awakens changed writers. I mean, it's there hasn't been peace on that side of the movie making in a, in, since Disney acquired Star Wars. And so you have to look at the track record and say... If this continues, and we, you know, just given reports recently, it is continuing, is she's done some good things. I don't want to sit here and say Kathleen Kennedy and Disney have been a disaster for Star Wars, because I don't believe that. I think we're getting awesome Star Wars all the time. But there are obviously some issues, especially issues that a big movie studio cares about in their behind-the-scenes work. And so... It's it's really rocky ground that we're treading in here. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't have said it better myself. I think the lowest hanging fruit is a Mandalorian movie. And t- to me, from my perspective, as being 40 years old, it's a tried and true perspective. Uh, there's so many different TV shows. Star Trek being one of my favorites, they made a bunch of TV shows. They made a bunch of movies. We're in Star Trek, but you only need like one movie. You know, uh they made Star Trek Next Generation. They made a TV show. They made a bunch of movies. Uh, they're making some really good TV show. I think there's a good movie to, uh, as you know, X Files is a good one. They made a bunch of TV shows. They made a bu- They made a movie, mm-hmm. and then they made a bunch more TV shows, and then they made another movie. The second one wasn't near as good as the first. No, it wasn't. But <laughs> um, I mean, uh, you know, this is Disney back in this. They got Filoni and Favreau. Maybe there's some ca- like. Uh, you know, they Disney's mo is to make a movie, and then in the '90s it was make crap movies after that, or make make some crappy TV show, mm-hmm. and they've kind of changed that, or they've actually lost all their ideas and just remaking them as quote unquote live action. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen the Little Mermaid trailers, but Sebastian in there looks straight awful, and so they got they need to check somebody's head on that one. But I mean, they got. They got such a such a great idea in Grogu, and uh, Grogu the movie, Mandalorian the movie. I don't, I don't know. I think I'm I'm speaking out of turn. I think I'm being the, my eternal optimist and stuff. And and I, you know, to me, from my perspective, that's a formula that has worked so well in the past that if they want to make a billion dollars, make and hype a Mandalorian movie. I don't know. Maybe this lower viewership's kind of soured them on some of that stuff. I don't know. Well, I want to push back on the Mandalorian movie thing because I don't, I don't agree, because the stakes for the Mandalorian are so low. The TV show stakes are so low. I love the show. This is not a critique of the Mandalorian, but if you compare the stakes of any of the trilogies to the Mandalorian, there's no stakes at all. I mean, every one of the trilogies is galaxy-defining stakes. The stakes of the Mandalorian are about the survival of the Mandalorians as a people. And that is an important story to tell. It's been an awesome story to tell. But unless we just ratchet that up to 11 somehow, and it would take, a, I just think, a lot of jump in the shark to ratchet that up so much. So, You'd have to have so much build to that that I really want to see a unique thing on the screen. I want to see some post-sequel, unique, and also people want Jedi in Star Wars. We're not getting that in Mando because we've had Luke a little bit in cameos. We've had Ahsoka. We're going to get some in Ahsoka. But they want this large Jedi versus something, light versus dark, black and white conflict that is classic Star Wars on the big screen. And I'm not sure that we can get that delivered 
in a Mando movie. Well, in in the past, the formula has been, let's take the characters that we love and put them in that role where it is. Like all the Star Trek characters, they go and stop the Genesis device. Uh, V'ger comes and to wreck the soul system, right? And, uh, you know, it's our favorite characters saving the day. Uh, I think they could easily slide in those roles. And I think Thrawn coming back would be a good opportunity for that. I don't know. I'm not a writer. I'm not... You, don't listen to me, but that's the, that's the movies I would encourage them to make. Um. Well, we do know that they're going to make a movie in 25 because despite the rumors around Damon Lindelof and all of the talk about him leaving the movie, they've already slated a new writer for that movie. Um. Some people are really excited. I'm not familiar with this writer's work insofar as I know what he's written. He's written Peaky Blinders. Super successful. I've got a bunch of friends who love the show, who have seen it a bunch, but I haven't seen it. Um, I don't think you've seen Peaky Blinders, but Stephen Knight is the writer of it, and he has come on board to finish up the script, um, probably tidy up the script that Damon Lindelof. I don't think he's writing a whole new screenplay. Um, And so they've got a new person helming the 2025 movie, and reports are still that it's on schedule, that they're going to be making it, and it's going to come out in 2025, and it's the same project that Lindelof's been tied to. Yeah, um, I've read a lot of good things about Peaky Blinders. I've had a lot of friends talk about how good it is. Um, it's on my list of stuff to watch. I'm watching um, another gangster thing about the 1920s, uh, Boardwalk Paradise. They, I guess I'll switch to the British version next. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, yeah, he's written a, a lot of really good stuff. Yeah. No, he's... Action. Shutter Island. Did you watch Shutter Island? I didn't oh see Shutter gosh, Island. He was on that. Movie. That's yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. See, the guy has some... I mean, he's got a good backlog. Damon Lindelof had a good backlog, but so does he. And so, I'm still... I mean, I'm not going to say I'm 100% confident in this product. And really, until we get a trailer, I can't say that I'm confident it's going to hit theaters. Because this we've had this happen multiple times with the name even announced. And then it fizzles. And so... I want to see it come. I want to see it come to fruition. We do not root against Star Wars on this podcast. We want it to succeed. And so it's just still on a little bit of shaky ground, but I'm happy that they have a writer and that they're moving forward. And by all indications, this will be one of the three movies announced at Celebration. Looking forward to it. So Uh, We're going to give a lot of coverage on Celebration. Yes, we'll have a whole, just like our first special we ever did for the podcast, we're going to have a whole Holonet News episode dedicated to all the news out of Celebration. You're not going to miss a thing. We're going to cover from movies all the way down to comic books and any other like action figures and toys and games and anything. Any of the news that comes out of Celebration, we're going to be here to talk about it. And we're going to round it all up for you. But speaking of a news roundup, we got a lot of really exciting Star Wars tabletop gaming news out of Adepticon. Adepticon happened just last weekend. And there is a bunch of information out there about the big Star Wars tabletop games. Colin and I have talked a bunch about how we used to play X-Wing. We both played a couple games of Armada. We play Legion right now. We are looking forward to Shatterpoint releasing, and there's news about all of it. Yeah, I, I looked through a lot of this stuff. I, I kind of wish I was more interested. There was also a big tournament uh, for X-Wing at Adepticon, like the Worlds mm-hmm, tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of this stuff looks really cool. Especially the Legion stuff, Ahsoka, ah- Ahsoka and Ewoks, Geonosians, the Bad Batch is releasing. That's cool. Yeah, Quizzers. No, it's very exciting. So we'll start with the Legion stuff. Um, each faction is getting some releases on some new troops or new leaders or new commanders, and so the Empire is getting Inquisitors. You as an Empire player, I want to know how excited you are about that. Yeah, they look like a lot of fun. You know, usually the uh, lesser leaders like that are cheaper in the game, and but still effective, especially force wheelers and lightsaber users. So it's going to be fun to see how they play out. And then I'm super pumped about the Geonosians. I can't wait to build them into my army because I play the Separatists, and we are lacking in core units, and so they're going to play really well into that. And it's just really cool. And Ahsoka is now a Rebels operative. That's going to be super fun to watch that play out. Yeah, Uh she's going to be powerful for sure. As far as X-Wing news, you know, they got some reprints from uh, 1.0 that they didn't make, a TIE Bomber and a a YT-2400. You know, we don't play this anymore. Oh, they also announced some starter boxes, which those are cool. You can grab 
a starter box off the shelf and you have a squadron to play. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's not tournament ready, but you have a full whatever point list you need now. Back when we played, it was 100, um, and you can roll right into games. Um, we don't play anymore. I wouldn't be super jazzed about the X-Wing stuff they announced because it's nothing new. It's reprints and reboxings of old things. Right. When we played, they were coming out with announcing stuff every quarter. Right. And there was a lot of anticipation. Uh, COVID and pandemic stuff and poor leadership has kind of messed up how they've done things with X-Wing. And yeah, uh, that's history, I guess. Yep, yep. Um, Armada, though, when we when when X-Wing was out and we were playing, Armada had been out for a couple of years, and it never really stuck. It never got a huge following. But for some reason, it's had a massive resurgence. You know, they introduced the Separatists in Republic to that. They've given the... Um, Rebels, some ships that they can contend the Empire with in size. They have a super Star Destroyer. If you've ever seen that on the yeah, table, it's like cool. two feet long. Um, it's all really cool and exciting stuff. Um, they didn't announce any new ships, but I feel like Armada has a little bit more excuse and way more limited number of giant, you know, frigate and up class ships that you can announce for a game. And Star Wars is rife with fighters. X-Wing, I feel like, still has ground to trot but for armada i feel like they've kind of touched everything so they announced some cards um and we don't play this but it just seems like it'd be a little hard to develop um but the you, cards looked cool yeah you'd think there'd be a cumulus class corsair on the horizon yeah certainly soon i don't know if they have a scum and villainy faction yet <laughs> but i'm sure that that's coming um and then the final game is the brand new game that is coming out by amg they are going uh, yeah atomic mass games they are releasing Star Wars Shatterpoint, which is similar to Marvel Crisis Protocol, if anyone listening has played that. Yeah, that's their flagship, AMG's flagship game, which they've done really well on. There's a lot of people. Extremely popular. The model range is relatively small, so it wouldn't be hard. I mean, you can start with your favorite characters and collect the whole range and make whatever force you like. Right, Which right. is going to be so fun to do with with this game. It's, you know, buying these characters, of which we, I don't know if they're going to be the same scale as Legion characters. but They are it, different. Larger bases, um, and there's like collections of different things. Yeah, so that's bases. smart. So you have to buy all the other yeah, ones. Yeah, exactly. You can't translate that easy. But even still, I'm not going to care if we want to practice the game. Right, right. Uh, you know, but, I mean, Mace Windu's in this, you said, right? Yeah, so Mace, Aura Singh, Cad Bane, Handmaidens from Naboo, and Mother Talzin all got announced for the factions that exist. This game started out as a Clone Wars era game, which is the first of these games to do that. All of the other tabletop games have started out as Empire and Rebellion and then expanded to include the Clone Wars era. This is doing that opposite because the other announcement was that there are now original trilogy groups coming. Right, and and so the, this game focuses on hero combat. Right, right. And so we all have our favorite characters, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or, and they're going to eventually include Darth Vader, why would you not? But Emperor Palpatine, you could do uh, Darth Sidious in this. Usually in a lot of these games they have two different ones. Uh, even though it's the same person, literally. Uh, and they have support characters, you know, they'll put R2-D2 in there and they could do, uh, in some games like this, I've seen where they do a Clone Wars version of, of somebody and then, and well, just like I said with Palpatine, but it's not just limited to him, an R2-D2 version and a original trilogy version. That'd be neat. Yeah, no, it's going to be super cool. Um, I'm looking forward to playing it and it was some good news out of Adepticon. I'm really excited to have heard all of this. Um, but you know, Colin, that wraps up our hollow net news segment. Um, we had a lot to cover. I'm happy that we got through that and I'm happy that all this Adepticon news came out. Super excited to try Shatterpoint, but we're going to get right into our star Wars moment of the week. You would be honored if you would join us. All right, Colin, what is your star Wars moment of the week? So I came into possession of a piece of property and I was surveying everything about it and I found something that somebody left is a Star Wars Episode One Incredible Cross no Sections. No way. Written by David West Reynolds, illustrated by Hans Jensen and Richard Chasemore. We should just video this, video <laughs> our podcast just for this. They had one of these in my elementary school library. I checked this out like weekly. This book is awesome. These cross-section books are phenomenal. So I want to leave it with you because the nostalgia factor is already off the charts, I can tell. But, like, it's got, what is this, Darth Maul's ship. It's got 
Corvettes. Man, this is amazing. It's got the the tr- the droid transport carriers. What is this? MTT large transport. The Gungan sub. Naboo Queen's Royal Starship. Pod, All racers. The pod racers. So there's something really. There's a really fun fact about this book that I bet you don't know. Um, when the Phantom Menace released, one of the nitpicks that fans had was that R two D two could not fit in the N one Starfighter. No way he could fit. You, it, there's no for lack of a better t- term, there's no room for his shoulders in it. <laughs> and so this book, I don't know if this book was explicitly created to write that issue, but this book writes the issue by explaining that R two D two and all astromechs detach their heads from their bodies when they get into N ones, and that their head like is elevated above their body when that's they're a, inside N one star. That's fires. their brain core or something that lets them operate. Yeah, exactly. Here, here's the cross section. I mean, oh no one yeah, can see you this. can see it. It's there, yeah. plain as day. Yeah. Um, I, this reminded me of the the pod racer was some funny meme. I don't know if we posted it or saw it elsewhere, but it was like you wake up and and legendary pod racer Ben Quadraneros yeah. is at the foot of your bed. <laughs> yeah. What do you do? What That's do you do? so funny because <laughs> it's such a it's such a weird callback. Right. But right. this book is amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw this and I flipped out. I had to snatch it out of the pile. It's in phenomenal shape for where I found it. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, this is bringing back a ton of memories. This is so cool. I mean, it's not just the ships and stuff. It's the droids. You know, what kind of uh, weapons they fire. Uh, speeders. So many cool little things. What and, an awesome book. Yeah. When was this put out? 1999. So they made it to come out right with the movie, right? Yep. And it's not big. There's It covers pretty much everything you see in the movies. Uh, but man, is it cool. <laughs> it is. That's awesome. That's a great Star Wars moment of the week. That's super cool. We'll have to post some pictures on our Instagram story of it. Because that is just super awesome. It's uh, That's super cool. Your, your Star Wars moment of the week definitely trumps mine. <laughs> This is super It's not cool. a competition, Carter. <laughs> um, my Star Wars moment of the week is much more modern than this one. Um, it's also a book. It is Jedi Battle Scars. I just finished the book. Um, yeah, it came out a couple weeks ago. I read through it. I think you're listening to it. Um, there are some highlights in this book. It bridges the gap between the two video games. Um, there's some cool moments some cool characterizations it explains something that'll be coming up in the next video game um but i gotta say the book definitely was not it didn't completely hit for me um i was happy to read it i love reading star wars books i love reading star wars canon i try to pick up every adult novel that they put out um and so i read through this book pretty quickly and like I said, there was some really good characterization moments and some really good tender moments between our characters. And there was some good explanation for some of the things that will come up in the next game. But there was some odd pacing issues. Um, there just seemed to be some text issues for me that um, didn't didn't jive well. And so this wasn't my favorite Star Wars book, but it's always a good day when you can finish a Star Wars novel and you get to put yourself in the universe a little bit more. And so it was really cool. It was awesome to get to to get to, you know, read, and I was really happy to have done it. But that is my Star Wars moment of the week. Excellent. I'm I'm listening to it too. I think in the first part of it, there was a double negative. Yes. You know, yeah. not only did the author write that, but the, it got past the editors. And you know, in the course of human language, you just say those things, and it's whatever. But to be writing something like that, it's it was, a little, it was a little odd. There was a few odd writing decisions. But, you know, again, always happy to read Star Wars books, and I'm really excited for the ones coming out soon. We're getting Cataclysm very soon, and it's the last adult novel in the High Republic Phase 2, and I'm super pumped for it. I cannot wait. Yeah, that's going to be neat. Um, so that wraps up our Star Wars Moment of the Week segment, and that's it for the show today. You know, this was a big show. We had a lot to cover. It was a super exciting Mando episode. We had all kinds of thoughts and theories. I hope that we left you guys with a lot. I mean, Zebarellios, man. It's That's all you have to watch this episode to even get because, wow, they just made that Lasat look so good and so real. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was phenomenal. Yeah, um, and lots of cool stuff on the horizon with Mandalorian. Yes. Can't wait to see what happens next. 
Yeah. And lots of cool stuff on the horizon for our podcast. We've got a con appearance coming up. We've got all kinds of specials coming up. We've got plans for May the 4th. We've got plans for celebration. You guys might notice right now, I think you can hear a little bit of music in the background playing. I hope that um, you guys like it. That's our new outro that we just got. Um, and we think it's really good. We were really happy. We just thought that it would help, help our podcast continue to flow. And these are the kind of upgrades we want to keep making. Um, if anyone can notice what song this is, this outro is based on, and you send us an email and let us know the name of the song, I'll send you a sticker. The first person to do that will send you a sticker. And so it's, it's, uh, we were really happy to get it done. Um, you can check out the guy who made it's Instagram. It's linker underscore 732. We got it on Fiverr. It was a, it was a great deal. You should check out his stuff at S H A H Z A I B D I N. I'm not even going to try to venture to figure out how to pronounce what that is. <laughs> hey, um, have we scheduled a date to record the RPG playthrough? We've got the RPG playthrough scheduled to record. We're going to be recording it late April. I believe it's the last Thursday in April that we're going to record. You're making me pull up old text messages to figure out in our group where we decided. But it looks like we're going to be recording on April 30th. And so we're going to record it that day. It'll release in May. You know, we'll have some sound editing to do and all of that. Again, we're going to be editing or we're going to be releasing the first episode for free right here on this platform. But for all the subsequent episodes, it'll only cost you $2 to join our Patreon and to listen to our brand new RPG playthrough. They're going to be long form episodes. If you like the kind of content that Colin and I are bringing you, this is that turned up to 11. It's a new, unique Star Wars story set in the timeline of The Mandalorian. We'll probably release a preview so you can tune in and you'll have to see what happens next. Yes, exactly. So we're really excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got so much on the horizon for the podcast. And if you want to continue to engage with us, guys, please visit all of our socials. We've got a big Instagram page, StarWars.Station. We've got a Twitter where you can hear all of our hot takes, SW underscore station. You can check us out on Twitch. Colin's going to be painting miniatures on Twitch. He's going to be streaming games on Twitch. I'm going to be streaming games on Twitch. Colin, what is our Twitch? Our Twitch is twitch.tv slash station media. And there's going to be some other stuff rolling out on that. We've got some new pages coming out for different forms of content. If you're not just a Star Wars fan, we've got a Harry Potter page out there. You should check out hp.station. Right, and I've kicked off just this past week a Warhammer dot station. I, I played I played that game for a many number of years, fifteen plus since two thousand six, and I'm I'm super. They're coming out with a new edition of that game, new rules. So it's a it's a great opportunity to spin this up, and gosh, if you like listening to us, you're, I, I know. Um, just as much about Warhammer as I do Star Wars. Probably a little bit more authentic on the little tidbits of knowledge. You know, Carter, he's the smart one here. I like the philosophy side of it a lot. So um, I, I'm I'm a one-man show over there. So tune in <laughs> right. and we're, get after that. Yeah. Right, there's already spots on our Discord. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, you can find the link for that on our link tree. Yeah, check out, check out our Discord. Check out our new Facebook group, Star Wars Station Cantina. We have, it's really active. And on all of these things, you can connect with us personally. Oh, yeah. Ask us questions, talk to us. And the last thing I'll say is join our Patreon. The first tier we have starts at a dollar. It goes up from there. Like I said, to get RPG access at $2, you can ask us and submit, you can submit show topics. You can do all kinds of stuff. We have different tiers for everything. We have t-shirts. We have all kinds of stuff. Check out the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Star Wars Station. Lots of really, really cool stuff there. We continue to grow there as we do everywhere. And we appreciate your listenership most of all. Please leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Give us a thumbs up. I mean, we're trying to grow on all these platforms, and we really appreciate your listenership. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. It's great to be with you all. Absolutely. You guys, may the force be with you. Keep it wizard.